How about that worship team? They don't just lead worship. They can get this uh, stage flipped too. Well done, guys. Well done. They didn't know that when they signed up. <laughs> right, right. Oh, man. Well, uh, good morning to you. And uh, we're, we're so glad to have you here at church today, online or in person. And uh, today we're going to be doing something a little bit different. A, a little different. A little bit riskier. Uh, and uh, if you come back next week, there will be a more uh, traditional message, sermon time. But today what we wanted to do uh, is we are wrapping up a series of teachings on a topic called Emotionally Healthy Spirituality and talking through how our emotions and our spirituality really intersect and affect our lives in so many different ways. And... Uh, Emotions can be a gift from God. It can also, you know, they can overtake our lives and lead us down destruction. And so we've talked about a lot of different topics over the last several weeks, like the emotions that Jesus felt. We've talked about how to deal with anger or anxiety or like going back in our past to be able to move forward. And uh, so all of these things I think have been really helpful. So thank you for your leadership on it. And um, so today, though, what we wanted to be able to do was be able to uh, open this up for any questions that you may have around emotionally healthy spirituality. And that's about the length of the parameters we have. Um, yeah, we, we ask you, uh, you know, don't curse in our <laughs> chat, I guess. I don't know. What other rules? We didn't really talk about the rules. Um, but, uh, you know, so... Uh, but honestly, we, we did prepare some questions ahead of time, and we've preloaded those on. And so anybody can text in any questions throughout the service. Um, there is a QR code there that you can use, or um, R for Rochester, calvary.org slash EHS for Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. Um, you can go right there. And not only can you submit questions, but you can also like upvote things that you uh, are interested in us talking about. But I, I wanted to start this morning by just asking, we've been talking about this for the last two months. Why have we been talking about this? Oh, that, that's a good question. I think the, the reason we want to be emotionally and spiritually healthy is so that we can love well. The, at the end of the day, it's not about increasing our status or our influence or any of those things. But our relationships with God and with others matter a lot. And so if we're going to love well, we do that best when we're healthy emotionally and spiritually. So that's been the reason for the focus. Okay. So what do you do if you recognize you are in an unhealthy emotional space? It's affecting your spiritual life. What, what do you do if you're seeing that internally in your own life? Well, welcome to reality. <laughs> um, I, would, I would ask how many people have never been unhealthy emotionally or spiritually. And then I would ask uh, everybody to look at those who raised their hands to see what denial looks like. <laughs> but uh, uh, we, ha we all have areas and seasons. You know, one of the surprises to me in life was that when I entered into marriage, I found that that was a very different season and I was presented with things I, I didn't know much about. And then when I became a parent, same thing happened. And then there are different responsibilities and occupations, vocations, that kind of thing. And so we're going to bump into seasons where we don't feel prepared or healthy. And so when that happens, owning it is the most important thing you can do. And if you are fortunate enough to have people around you that kind of call it to your attention, that's a gift. And then it helps you know some things to focus on. Um, one of the things I'm, I'm convinced is true is that I cannot be self-aware without others in my life. I have blind spots. The church tends to focus on sin spots, but we have blind spots, and we can miss a lot or do a lot of damage with those. And so um, then I want to start working on those, whatever that may be. It, there's a variety of things it can be. Yeah. Now, what about if there's unhealthy people around you? It's like less about you, but there's you know, outside of you, people close in your life. Uh, what kind of boundaries do you set up in order to make sure they're not, you know, you're not taking on their stuff, but you're also trying to be like a loving, kind neighbor to people? How, what, do you, what do you do with that? I think this is an area where Christians tend to overcompensate because of many things we know about God and about his word. 
And so we don't speak truth in love because we don't think we can speak truth in love. And uh, there are things that could be addressed. If someone's not healthy around you, uh, calling attention to it in a non-anxious way is a very, it's, it's a very important skill to learn. Um, but, but trying to control outcomes of people is a fool's errand. It just doesn't work. I, I, I have trouble controlling myself. I really can't control anybody else. When you see a, an example of, of a, how many would agree, let's just check, that Judas was unhealthy? That's about half of you. <laughs> it, it makes me worry about the half that didn't raise their hands. If he's healthy, I don't know. And what's interesting is that Jesus doesn't try to control him, but he doesn't hide things either. Like he tells them, go do what you're going to do. But he also, when he comes and he kisses them, he says, are you betraying me with a kiss? There's an honesty there, but you don't see him exploding. You don't see him becoming overly defensive. You don't see him trying to control someone. I think learning to speak the truth and, and then let that person wrestle with it. Yeah. That's good. Uh, so God says to love your enemies. Yeah. How do you love but don't want to be friends with people who have hurt you deeply? Again, it kind of ties into that boundaries question, but, but there's also this mandate to love not even just our neighbor, but our enemies. So wh how do you, how do you, what do you do with that when it's like a friendship type relationship? Yeah. Um, so this will sound, I don't know how this will sound to you. And um, uh, that's the risk of a Q and A. <laughs> Some friendships are seasonal. Not every friendship is meant to last your whole life. Thank God for the season that they were a part of your life and let them go. Um, we, we try to force people who don't want to be in a relationship with us to be in a relationship with us. And it, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. I read a phenomenal story. Uh, I, can't, I can't recommend the book, mostly because of the language that's in it. But this man uh, is at his uh, wife's bed as she's dying with cancer. And something occurred to him there that he had never thought of until that moment. Uh, she told him that he, she did not love him when he asked her to marry him. And he told her, if you say yes, you will grow to love me and we will have a great marriage. And she said yes. And as she's dying, it occurred to him, she deserved to have a marriage with someone that she loved, not just someone that loved her. Now that's not a, 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 an admonition to go end your marriages. Uh, that's not the point. But to think about that, sometimes we want to control the relationship and we're unwilling to let a person walk away. We can love them and that we still want what's best for them. We don't want to harm them, but that doesn't mean that we're going to have the same level of relationship that we've been able to enjoy. Yeah, and I think if we confuse that consistent love means our relationship has to look how it looked in the previous season, we could, we could get that twisted. You could still be for the person, even if Absolutely. you're not always in relationship with them. Okay. Um, so is it possible to be growing in my faith while at the same time deeply hurting emotionally, or is emotional health a, a prerequisite for spiritual growth? Okay, um, <laughs> why am I not preaching a message today? <laughs> this will be our last time doing this, so please text in your questions now no, if you are, want to get them answered. These are, the, the problem with the question is it's a really good question. Um, so what I would say is uh, it depends. I think that it is unwise to develop a definition of spirituality that says if I'm spiritual, I will never know pain or discomfort or nothing will ever feel bad in my life. We can hurt for a lot of reasons. If, if someone we love dearly is, has passed away, we're, we're gonna hurt deeply over that. If we lost a job that we deeply loved, we're going to grieve that loss. If, if there's a friend that's walked away, if, if there's a physical condition that we're facing that is now going to limit our life in ways we hadn't anticipated, that is, uh, that's a lot of, of uh, pain to walk through. And in those moments, that pain does not prove your spirituality is wrong. Your spirituality is what will help you process that pain in a healthy way. 
There are other kinds of pain, and those kinds of pains can be kind of self-inflicted things where we have really been uh, maybe selfish in our relationships, uh, demeaning, demanding of others, and that creates a kind of tension and pain. And that could be an indicator that spiritually we've got some ground to make up now. Like we need God's help and we need God's word in order to be able to see how we're supposed to treat people and how we're supposed to act. So I would say it's not an automatic thing, but I would really caution against any definition of spirituality that says, if I'm spiritual, then I will not know pain. That you can't find, Jesus said something quite different. He said, in the world, you will have tribulation. But take heart, I've overcome the world, <laughs> which is the good hope at the end that, of that. Yes. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, so um, what if somebody is feeling a feeling of purposelessness within the search for life direction, and it's, it's directly resulting from spiritual and emotional immaturity? Mm. Like those two, two things are tied together. And I think, I do think that all of us crave being a person of purpose. I think that's like innate in who we are, um, but what about when you have this feeling of purposeness, but it's a direct result of kind of spiritual and emotional immaturity? Hmm. Um, I, I think there's a, a couple of nuances to this too. Some of us want a sense of purpose in life because it simplifies our lives, and we all prefer a simpler life. So I just want to know what I'm supposed to do and when I'm supposed to do it. And, and some of us have defined that as purpose. And I'm not convinced that that's true. Um, I think there's more to a purpose in life than that. I do think that, uh, especially when something happens in our life, we, we will question our purpose. And sometimes we will wonder if we don't have a purpose right now because we're in a transition. Um, if you're going from one job to a next, uh, if, you've, uh, if you've lost a spouse, uh, those kinds of things, that, that can really disorient us. And in those moments, I do think that spirituality is super beneficial because a lot of us will just try to medicate the pain. And, and our culture has created an almost infinite number of ways to do that. Like we can binge anything, literally. And, uh, and then it makes us not think about stuff. So I don't think that that's helpful at all. I think that sometimes the pain can remind us that we need to do some spiritual work. And that, that is really spending time with God, being honest with him about what you're going through. But we, I think I said it last week, we don't find meaning in our work. We find meaning in our rest. We find meaning in our relationship with God. And so leaning into that when you're in pain is hard. Um, I've talked to a lot of people who've been in a crisis situation and, uh, and they try to read and they try to pray and they can't think, they can't focus. And if you've ever, if you've ever had that happen to you, it's, it's horrible. And so what I tell them is, you know, don't try to, to read a whole chapter or spend a whole half hour. Uh, see if you can do two minutes, see if you can do five minutes. Uh, I would rather you pray really short, simple prayers multiple times a day than to try to pray a long prayer, tap out, and not do anything. So I, I do think that that sense of purposelessness can drive us back to God. I hope that's what it does. But, um, but also just be aware, uh, don't use it as a crutch just to simplify your life so that you don't have to make real decisions anymore. That's good. Um, and I do just want to encourage everybody as we're going through, there's like a ton of great questions right now in the queue. So you can keep submitting questions. But if, uh, if there are questions you would like us to ask, you can like upvote them and, and uh, make them pop up to the top there. Um, how, how can someone who's got more of an intellectualist, a, a logical approach to faith, how can they apply emotional principles to their life as well? Yeah, I mean, we're all wired a little bit differently, right? Some of us are more uh, aware of and comfortable with our emotions. And some of us uh, just prefer to reason and logic things out. And so, and we, and we will all take our approaches, our favorite approaches with us into our spirituality. And, uh, uh, and, and one is not better than the other. 
right? But there is this, uh, if you are a more intellectual, there is an idea that people who are led by their feelings or their heart are more capable of being deceived than people who uh, think things through. But the Apostle Paul didn't say that. The Apostle Paul, that we can be deceived by our mind and our heart, that our thoughts can be deceived. So, so anywhere we think is our strength, we should bring some humility to that. And so if you, if you uh, lean into the emotional side of you, uh, don't be afraid of some logical, reasonable things that are true about God and his word. And if you are uh, more um, academic or intellectual in your approach to some things, don't be afraid of your feelings. You do have them. Um, uh, you, you might be stuffing them down. And all I will tell you is if you stuff them down long enough, eventually they will come out in a place and in a way you don't want them to. And you won't like that. And other people won't recognize you. So truth. Uh, okay. This, this is our uh, top voted question of the day. What do you think the topic is? I have no idea. I hope it's emotionally healthy spirituality. <laughs> well, I, I will say this. Um, I, I was asking my 10 year old son, I was telling him like, we're going to do something different. We're going to like be able to ask pastor Bob any question. So I asked him, what would you ask pastor oh, Bob? So his first, he had two questions. His first was, so Christians believe that like they follow the one true God, mm. but then other people believe that too. How do you know that we have the one true God? So I'll let you do a whole sermon series on that one. But then I was like, oh, great question, buddy. His second question is, how old is Pastor Bob? <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, I said, no, don't ask that, buddy. I don't, I don't, I don't know which question is harder. So, <laughs> oh no. So I am 130 years old. <laughs> right, <wow. and> <laughs> That's how you got all that wisdom, all right. Okay. No, here, if you're actually, I'm 65 years old. Oh, there so, you go. Yeah. I love that. No. It's transparent. On the on inside, fronts. I'm a lot younger. <laughs> but uh, uh, the, the, the one true God thing is a fair question, and I wish more people would ask it. Uh, I think uh, Christians sometimes are afraid of questions like that. We don't have to be. Uh, I can't prove to someone that God is the one true God. I can prove to, to anyone that, that our God is different than every other God because there's been no other God that laid down his life right. and paid the price for people who are imperfect and wrong. Mm -hmm. There's only one God that's done that. And so I can't prove he's the only one, but I can prove there's no other God like him. Amen. Yeah. Uh, okay. So the actual top question, <laughs> uh, what, what steps would you give to a busy family trying to implement a weekly Sabbath with kids and teens who don't know where to start? Uh, yeah, I, I can say relatable. <laughs> uh, so I'd, I'd love your wisdom on that. Yeah, I, don't, I uh, will find out if it's wisdom or not. So a couple things. Uh, this would be the hard part. Let's get that out of the way. Sometimes you have to say no to things. We've kind of surrendered to an idea that to be the best parent, I have to let my kids do everything. And uh, it's, we actually overwhelm them sometimes. I wonder if, if part of the anxiety our, our, our kids in our culture is feeling is, is because they're just over-involved in so many things. They're just trying to do everything. And so maybe a parent has to say no, which is hard. Uh, my kids never uh, liked it when I said no. Uh, and, and some of that can be seasonal too. It's one of my favorite stories about my daughter. Uh, she was in the car, we were driving together and she, uh, she said to me, she said, I'm going to ask you for something and I know you're going to say no. And I said, well, this is the easiest conversation of the day. <laughs> and, and she asked me if she could do something and I, I thought about it for a minute and I said, yes, you can do that. And she said, why? I asked you this last year and you said no. And I said, you're a year older and I think you can handle it now. And then I watched her sit back in the chair in the car and start thinking and wondering, what are all the other things I could do now? <laughs> so sometimes we have to say no. And then uh, it's really hard to find a 24 hour period that the whole family can have a Sabbath on. Like if you've got two working parents and their schedules don't line up, kids that are in school may be involved in uh, sports activities, uh, extracurriculars, things like that. And so what I would recommend is start with something. It's better to start with something than wait until you can do a whole thing. 
and then look for ways to find delight. Because uh, a lot of people approach Sabbath as though it's a ritualistic, legal approach to God doesn't want you to do anything on this day. And what God wants you to do, is, what he wants you not to do is work so that you can enjoy and delight in the gifts that he's given you. And so uh, I know one uh, little kid, every time he gets off the bus coming home from school on Friday, in that family, their, their Sabbath begins on, on Friday at sundown. And the kid jumps off the bus and he's thrilled. He's yelling as he runs up to his parents, it's Sabbath, it's Sabbath, because he gets ice cream on Sabbath. And who wouldn't want that, you know? So I think finding, if, if you can't do a, a whole day, like even an evening, uh, and some families like board games. Uh, some, some families uh, get hostile when they play board games. You gotta find the thing that, that works for your family and do, do that and, and delight in it. And, and that will grow over time. Yeah, that's good. I, I do think, you know, I'm, I am in the middle of that season right now. Just like one of the practical things Sarah and I have tried to do is to say like, we are gonna let our kids do like one sport at a time. Like that has been a helpful framework. Now I will say we have not been even perfect at that execution, like even upcoming, like these two sports overlap and things. And so I, I, don't, I don't wanna sound like we've arrived and we're perfect at it because um, there's a tension there. But I do think you're, you're right in getting to the, to the heart of Sabbath. Like I definitely feel like I've in the past had this like feeling of like, I really just need to like sit and chill and I either need to be like reading a book or watching TV. And those can be great activities for a Sabbath if it's rejuvenating. Um, but like part of it for me even was like, I wanna find things that my family and I can do that we're gonna to enjoy together. And um, yeah, even part of it is like, I like being active. So like, I am gonna get some basketball runs in on some of those days and, and stuff like that, cause I really enjoy that. And so it, it reframes, like it doesn't mean 24 hours or all my waking hours of inactivity. It, it really is rest and rejuvenation. And it's, it's starting from that place. And it goes directly against the grind hustle culture that just gets like, just bombarded down our throats. And I think, I think we've got to battle against that. And it's, it's a, it's a great value to be a hard worker. Um, but it's, it's, it goes against the heart of God's intention of being for us when we're working seven days a week and doing, and you know, and uh, I, I think that we don't end up being emotionally as healthy and spiritually as healthy as we could be when we don't follow after that. But but we will get celebrated and we will get promoted and we will, you know, it's the only yes. one of the commandments that that's going to happen. You murder somebody, you ain't getting promoted at work, um, but you do that on your Sabbath and you work all day, like it, it, it has direct benefits to maybe your career, but I don't think it does for your soul. Agreed. Yeah. Okay. Um, this is another really good one. Um, I was hurt by someone I love and a lack of forgiveness is really impacting many aspects of my emotional health. How do I start the process of radical forgiveness? <laughs> radical forgiveness. Mm -hmm. That's, that is a great phrase. I'm going to use that in a message, so whoever sends it in. Um, I think that um, we have to separate our actions from our feelings. And a lot of us, if we feel anger, resentment, frustration, whatever it is towards that person, we're convinced we have not forgiven them. And uh, in fact, there, you, you probably have heard this uh, in our culture as well as in Christianity, you know, to forgive is to forget. And so if that were true, all I would have to do is just hit you in the head hard enough that you would forget. And uh, that's not forgiveness, that's abuse, <laughs> that's not a good thing. I think that um, we have to open a dialogue with God where we acknowledge two things. One is the emotions that we're feeling towards that person. We're just, we just have to be honest about it. And if you read through the Psalms, uh, you'll see songs like that, the lyrics to songs. I mean, th there, are, there are times when David wrote lyrics to song. Uh, in one place he said, uh, God, if you could just hit that person in the jaw hard enough to knock out their teeth, I would be good with that. 
Can you, yeah. can you turn that into a quick song for us? <laughs> <laughs> we worship team, I could sing that I, for us. If, I, I don't want to go viral for that. <laughs> um, so I think that a lot of times, because we still have strong feelings regarding that person, we think we've not forgiven. Forgiveness is basically the decision that I will not hurt that person back for what they did to me. That's what it is. And if you have decided that, and you are not hurting that person back, and there's a lot of ways to hurt them, like we can go run, tell a bunch of other people, make sure they all know what this person did to us, but there's a lot of ways to hurt them. Once we decide, I'm not gonna hurt you back, that is forgiveness, but now we're gonna have to process the emotions of what was done against us, and might, they, they still might be doing things against us. And uh, uh, you know, if, if a situation is not safe, you, you are allowed to get out of that situation. Uh, there's no scripture that requires you to stay in an abusive relationship. So I, I think that we beat ourselves up because we're still struggling with emotions and we think we haven't forgiven. Um, this is what uh, I do, try to do, and that is I try to acknowledge uh, my emotion. Father, I'm really struggling with my thoughts about that person today. I find myself revisiting conversations. I find myself being angry, and I need your help with that. The second thing that I do is I remind myself and God, I have chosen to forgive them, so my commitment is I will not hurt them for what they've done. And what I will tell you is, uh, over time, the emotions become more normalized, and I'm okay. Uh, if I try to deny those emotions, uh, that thing stays as fresh a year, two years, five years down the road as it was the day it happened. Right. And that, that's, not, that's not a great option, so. Yeah, thank you. All right, so I'll, I will invite the worship team out. And um, the last question I'd love to have uh, you answer for us uh, is, what has been the least healthy season of your life? And what, what kind of created that season? How did you recognize it? And what did you do about it when you did? Um, yeah. I would say um, there's a couple of seasons that have been really unhealthy. One caused by how I was living and another uh, thing caused by uh, what was done against me. The, the first one, my life was unhealthy because uh, I was refusing to lean into and take responsibility for things and I found spiritual language to make it sound spiritual. Um, I was, well, I'm just turning it over to God. Mm. And uh, I was advocating responsibility in a number of areas of, and actually, technically, in all the areas of my life. And uh, my wife called that to my attention. We were driving in the car and both kids had fallen asleep in the back seat. And uh, she said, is this a good time to talk? And for all the, the men in the room, that's code. <laughs> you have to know that the, the conversation is about to turn serious. And I said, yes, and she, and she named that. And, and she told me, I, I don't know what to do about it. And I don't know if you know what to do about it, but you need to start thinking about it. It's not good for you. It's not good for the church you lead. It's not tr good for the family. It's not good for our relationship. It's not good for the kids. And uh, I went through a two-year process of literally deconstructing my life and rebuilding it on healthier principles. And it was grueling work. And, and I wish I could tell you that all of those defaults have changed. I still have an inert tendency to lean some ways, but I trust the wisdom of God over my own defaults. And so I just try to lean into that. The, the second thing that happened, and just so you know, this is nobody involving the church, because sometimes people start becoming Sherlock Holmes and trying to figure out who's responsible. <laughs> probably the story you're about to tell, they're gonna be like, that's probably Jonathan. <laughs> that's probably what they're thinking. <laughs> Um, I had two friends that, uh, they, were, they were good friends, and they betrayed me in ways I did not see coming. And uh, they, they said things about me that were untrue. They made decisions that significantly impacted my life, and they, uh, they allowed things to be said in which they didn't defend me at all. And it was uh, so hurtful because I, 
I thought I had a bunch of assumptions related to that relationship and that they proved all of them proved to be untrue. And uh, in a situation like that, there's the process of the pain. That's hard. But there's another thing that I was unprepared for. And it was this question. Am I the kind of person that can't tell who the good people are and the bad people are? What else am I missing in my life? Who else am I trusting that's going to, that's going to hurt me? And that is such an unhealthy rabbit trail to go down. You can isolate yourself from everyone. And so when you experience that, rather than say, I can't be in relationship with anyone, lean into the relationships that are life-giving, including spiritual ones, including friends and, and family. And, and then for me, like I, I was not able to sleep at night. It just wrapped me up. I was not able to, uh, all my thoughts were just, I, it, it was constant in my head. I couldn't get away from it. Mm -hmm. Uh, high levels of anxiety. And uh, so I, I started uh, conversations with a counselor, which was a very safe place to say things. I couldn't take this information to other people. It would have violated a, a point of my integrity in life. And so I, but I needed to talk to someone. And it took a while, but I got my balance back and I got my strength back and I sleep pretty good at night. So, yeah. Praise God. Um, I'd love uh, to, and thank you for putting yourself on this hot seat, by the way. Can we all just thank him for today? Um, but I, I, would love, uh, I would love to conclude this part of our service by just having you pray for us as a church and for our emotional health. So church, would you receive this this morning? Father, the, the pathway before us is often unclear. And sometimes we find ourselves in a season and we don't know if we strayed or you, you brought us to that place. And not knowing that's hard, it's, it's really challenging. Um, for those of us who find ourselves in that situation, would you help us lean into you? That you're not unaware, you haven't become uncaring, you're, you're not trying to hurt us, you're for us. And we can take the steps that might be uncomfortable because you're with us. And uh, I just ask that you would help us flourish, that we would thrive as we get healthier emotionally and spiritually. And for all of us, that may look a little bit different, but uh, for all of us, it always includes getting closer to you. So we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen.